And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, would that wild deer eating out of my garbage also enjoy long walks on the beach? And will my Facebook page show my image-conscious employer just how much I resemble Michael Douglas currently? And now, the podcast host whose snappy comebacks online are comparable to the elasticity in his very own underwear waistband, <laughs> Pete Dominic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you, Pete Coe. Thank you, John Carroll, who sings Stand Up for us at the beginning and end of every single daily episode of Stand Up with Pete Dominic. And this song is available for you to download on all platforms July 1st. John Carroll, everybody. You should follow him, by the way, on Instagram at JDCarroll88, as well as Twitter and John Carroll, no H, two R's, two L's, JohnCarroll.org. And you too can own this song and listen to it anytime. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast today. I've got a great guest for you. The legendary Sarah Kenzior joins me, the co-host of Gaslit Nation, New York Times bestselling author. My guest today, we cover a lot of ground together. This is the final week of June, which means in my area and unfortunately in many of the places you live, there's going to be fireworks all week. They already started Friday night. Right when I did a virtual gig, as soon as I cracked the mic open, my neighbor started launching off fireworks like he absolutely knew it, but I don't think he did. Anyway, I'm not a fireworks fan. This is the week where I complain about fireworks. If you love them, I won't let that come between us. But it is the final week of June as we head into the 4th and an exciting weekend. I spent the day driving up and back from Lake George, New York, where I dropped my 16-year-old off for five weeks of camp. Five weeks. She's a counselor in training, a CIT. She's very excited. Of course, I'm devastated because I'm super close with Ava. And uh, a lot of you apparently uh, don't understand the whole idea of camp culturally. Apparently, Thursday night, we were kind of arguing about it. My good friend David Campbell in Australia doesn't understand it. I, I see it this way. You send them off to learn independence, to learn confidence, and that's exactly what has happened with my daughter now in a third year of this camp, the YWCA camp. YMCA camp? Either way, very excited uh, for her, but I'm definitely going to miss her. And how do you feel about camp? That's my big question to you today. All right, I've got a lot to get to. It is Monday, so we'll go through what happened over the weekend. It's time for what I call the last 24 right here on Stand Up. <laughs> Of course, the huge news over the weekend was this condominium just collapsing in Miami Beach, Surfside, Florida. At least nine people are dead. Over 150 people are missing as a residential building partially collapsed. Search and rescue teams are continuing to try to find survivors. There are rescue teams that are now helping from Haiti and Mexico and Israel. And the cause of the collapse is still unknown, but I'm sure we'll find out soon. I don't really have much to say or to add to that really terrible, horrible situation coming out of South Florida right now. Other big story over the weekend, of course, uh, president, former president and disgraced, not billionaire Donald Trump gave a 90 minute speech in Ohio where people walked out. It was so boring. He played all the horrible hits and uh, hopefully nobody got sick with the Delta variant, which J.L. Coban tweeted he hopes would be the keynote speaker. I uh, shared that tweet, and uh, some of you thought that was distasteful. I don't blame you. I just thought it was a funny joke. I'm a terrible person. Anyway, the other big news came from The Atlantic Magazine, where Jonathan Carl, who is of ABC News but also contributor to The Atlantic, dropped a story about his reporting on Bill Barr. Huge story last night. The headline, Inside William Barr's Breakup with Trump in the final months of the administration, the doggedly loyal attorney general finally had enough. And it's a must-read story, but a lot of people reacting to that. President Biden ordered military strikes on the Iran-Syria border against Iran-backed militias. And the Pacific Northwest recording their hottest day ever, specifically in Portland and in other cities. Seattle may smash, smash all-time temperatures as well. 
Those are some of the top headlines from the weekend. Let's get to some of the audio that I grabbed for you for today's show. Give you some context on some of these and other stories. And I'd like to start, if you don't mind, with CBS Face the Nation, John Dickerson, who had Scott Gottlieb on, the former FDA commissioner, and he asked him about the new ways to try to get folks vaccinated. I thought this was pretty good. In our previous discussions, you've talked about having to change the way in which vaccines are delivered, that officials have to come up with more clever and interesting ways. I wonder in that context what you think of the, the New York uh, effort that the mayor there has um, is going to have at, at home vaccinations. Do you think that's does that make some sense? And, and that, might that be a way to pierce some of this hesitancy? Yeah, I think it's exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be thinking about more bespoke ways to deliver the vaccine. We also need to move away from sort of a top-down national campaign to get people vaccinated and make more of a grassroots campaign, empower local leaders, local physicians to try to help reach out into the communities to get people vaccinated. People who are going to be convinced to get vaccinated by Tony Fauci or the Surgeon General, or me for that matter, probably are already vaccinated. And so we need to get into the vaccines into the hands of doctors, make it easier for doctors to supply vaccines in their offices. And both companies are trying to come up with formulations that will be easier to deliver in a doctor's office, including Pfizer, the company I'm on the board of. Um, we need to empower doctors to be vaccinating and supply the resources to do that. There was a study out from the Commonwealth uh, Foundation this week that showed of the people who remain unvaccinated, about 50 percent said they would be most convinced to become vaccinated from their local physicians, from their doctors. And so that's what we need to shift to. We need to shift to more of a grassroots, bottom-up campaign and move away from this top-down national campaign as we enter into the fall. There will be people seeking out vaccination heading into the fall as people contemplate going back to work and back to school. So I'm still optimistic we'll pick up more of the American population and get them vaccinated. But it's going to slow down um, as we get into the summer and prevalence declines and people feel safer. Yeah, Scott Gottlieb on Face the Nation using the word bespoke. Who uses the word bespoke made for a particular customer or user? There has to be an application or an approach or way to convince people that haven't gotten vaccinated that they should. So they need a bespoke method. That was pretty impressive. All right, let's head over to MSNBC, where my friend Ali Velshi was interviewing the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. Did you have you heard about that? Hear about this? There's maybe a spray or a pill uh, in experimental trials right now that could knock COVID out. I thought this was very important and interesting if you hadn't heard about it yet. So there has been talk of a nasal spray and there's been talk from Dr. Fauci about a pill. Do these, does the spray and the pill exist now? And if not, when will they and what will they do? Well, they're in experimental phase, uh, running clinical trials. There are monoclonal antibodies for infusion, which do work. Let me be sure people know about that. If you're in a high-risk category and you just got diagnosed with COVID-19, ask about getting a monoclonal antibody infusion that may keep you from getting really sick and ending up in the hospital. The nasal spray version is appealing because it doesn't require an intravenous infusion. And the pills, Ali, are the next thing that we really want to push hard on. And you mentioned in the opening this announcement this week that the White House is putting $3 billion into a major effort to develop these highly effective and safe oral agents, pills, that you could take immediately after getting a positive test that would basically knock that virus out. This is a hard problem. This takes all of the skills of the public and the private sector working together. But there are already three of these agents now in clinical trials, and we're hopeful that one or more of them will work. It's kind of like what we had to do for HIV uh, 25 years ago to come up with a way to identifying the Achilles heel for this virus and then designing a drug that will go right there, knock out the virus, but not hurt you. All right. That guy is looks exactly like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, and he's so likable and kind and smart. Anyway, here's more from him on Velshi. Everything you need to know about the Delta variant. This is the virus that ran through the country of India with terrible consequences in terms of high death rates and high transmissibility. And it has now moved out of India and other parts of the world. The UK now is overrun with this Delta variant. It's the main one you see there. And here in the US, it's coming up quickly. It's about 10% now of the isolates. And people are predicting, based on the shape of that exponential curve, that by August, this will be the dominant strain. And it is worrisome because it is about 60% more transmissible than the previous record holder, which is the alpha variant. 
And it also, according to a Scottish study that just came out a few days ago, seems about twice as likely to put you in the hospital if you get this one. And that includes young people. So that's all the bad news. The good news, Ali, is that the current vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, the two shots, give very good protection, probably 88 percent protection against getting sick from Delta. So that's good. That just means one more reason uh, to get those shots. And by the way, if you only got one of those and you thought, well, that's good enough, not against Delta. The protection after one shot is only about 33 percent. So get that second shot if for some reason you have put it off. And listen, America, we have a chance here not to have another big surge. And Delta is the threat for that. But there are communities now that don't have high enough vaccination rates to avoid an outbreak. If we could really push hard in the next week or so to try to get those rates up as high as they can, and there's no reason you can't find a place near you that's mm -hmm. ready to help you out. Roll up your sleeve. It's time. I mean, I, I really wonder who's watching Velshi uh, in the morning on Saturday that hasn't been vaccinated, but uh, hopefully that broke through. Good information from Dr. Francis Collins, what a likable fella he is. And like I mentioned earlier, the former attorney general and Fred Flintstone look like Bill Barr working very hard at trying to repair the horrific damage to his reputation. He's now opening up about his arguments with the former president near the end of his presidency and in a series of interviews with Jonathan Carl. He said he suspected that Trump's claims of election fraud were bullshit from the start. He said, my attitude was it was put up or shut up time. If there was evidence of fraud, I had no motive to to suppress it. But my suspicion all the way along was that there was nothing there. It was all bullshit. He said so much more in this interview, but it's all bullshit coming from him too, because he also encouraged some of these lies at the beginning. Here is CNN's Ellie Honig, who has written a book about this that's coming out. I'm trying to get him on right now. It's called Hatchet Man, How Bill Barr Broke the Prosecutor's Code and Corrupted the Justice Department. Here he is yesterday with CNN's Pamela Brown. Well, Pam, the Bill Barr image rehabilitation tour is underway, and he's offering up a bunch of self-serving revisionist history garbage. Did Bill Barr in December of 2020, after the election was over, stand up and say there's no evidence of election fraud? Yes, he did. However, What's more important is that in the months leading up to the election, Bill Barr was one of the most vocal, most visible proponents of the big lie. I'll give you a couple examples. He did an interview with NPR in June 2020. And by the way, we have examples coming election. up in a graphic, but go ahead. Sure, sure. He spoke to NPR and he talked about the threat of election fraud counterfeiting from foreign countries. And NPR then had to run a piece where they quoted experts who said the things Bill Barr said were, and I quote, preposterous, false, and quote, nuts. He repeated it in Congress a month later. He even came on our air here on CNN and tried to tell Wolf Blitzer that DOJ had a case involving 1,700 false ballots. Turned out that case was not a DOJ case and it involved one false ballot, a single false ballot. DOJ had to walk that back too. So the bottom line here is Bill Barr pumped up the big lie as much as anybody in the crucial months leading up to the election. All right. So that's Ellie Honig on CNN. who has got a book coming out about Bill Barr. And here is my friend Glenn Kirshner on his YouTube channel talking about this article as well. And he says it reveals incriminating evidence of Trump's guilty knowledge, corrupt intent and criminal mens rea. Listen to Glenn. The Kirsten Report. The second thing I want to talk about is that Bill Barr provides direct evidence of Donald Trump's corrupt intent, his guilty knowledge, his criminal mens rea. Information that will be extremely valuable to, among others, the prosecutors in Georgia who are investigating Donald Trump for that criminal phone call he placed. You've heard the recording where he's asking Georgia state election officials to, you know, find me around 11,000 votes so I can be wrongfully declared the winner in Georgia. Well, Bill Barr relates some direct statements by Donald Trump that provide evidence of his guilty knowledge, his corrupt intent, his criminal mens rea. 
All right, that's Glenn Kirshner from his YouTube channel. I'll try to get him on this week so that he can explain what criminal mens rea is, which really does sound like some kind of male menstrual syndrome issue, but it's not. I think it's Latin or legal or something. Anyway, we'll see if Donald Trump's in big trouble. I've been hearing that for four years, and still, still, uh, nothing's caught up with him. Nothing really seems to stick to him this week. Uh, over the weekend, he was in Ohio giving a speech. And God bless CNN's Donny O'Sullivan. He's always at the scene of these president, uh, former President Trump rallies or wherever he's going to be. And he caught up with some Trump supporters for CNN. Listen to these exchanges. Just, I mean, I, I, I got to share them with you. Here he is, CNN's Donny O'Sullivan with Trump supporters at the rally in Ohio over the weekend. And your uh, no, shirt here know. says Trump won. Yes, he did. Is this about 2016? It's about all of them and 2020 and the next one. But he lost in 2020, right? No, no. Do you think what happened on the 6th of January was a sort of stain on his presidency? Um, this was all staged. I, I truly believe that. <laughs> Who do you think did the insurrection then? I think a lot of it comes back with the Democrats. Right. Yeah. But like all the people indicted in jail now, like all big Trump supporters. Okay, we'll see. Things will come out. Do you think the insurrection on January 6th was a stain on his presidency? No, I do not. I think the FBI, the corrupt FBI, was involved in it. Oh. I do. Oh. Well, there's some, there's some information coming out that there's a possibility. Well, I'm going to skip anything that Trump actually said right ahead to uh, Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who on CNN on Sunday uh, called the rally eight months after the election a rally for a loser. You saw yesterday was a recycling of all his old talking points. It was a rally of a loser president. I mean, he's the first president to lose reelection in decades. And uh, I don't know why these folks would go there and, and, you know, in essence, ogle at and in many cases, just short of worship a loser. But they did. And the interesting thing is, you know, he didn't talk much about the candidate uh, running against Anthony Gonzalez, who's a fantastic person, Anthony is. Uh, the guy running against him at one point, I know Trump made it sound like he went and negotiated world peace in North Korea. The guy worked at Vance, which is a really entry-level position, not to put it down, but you're not negotiating with world leaders. And All right, that is current-serving Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger on uh, Donald Trump being a uh, massive loser. Apparently people were walking out of that speech. You, there, there's video of, of people just leaving because he went on and on for 90 minutes and he's just really not that good anymore. He, he's just playing the hits and the bits and they, they're, they're done. He's not able to capture the crowd perhaps anymore. Oh, we can hope. And now here is shocking audio of right-wing pastor Greg Locke, who used his sermon on Sunday to allege that there are child trafficking tunnels under the Capitol, the White House, and accused Joe Biden, Oprah Winfrey, Tom Hanks of being a bunch of pedophiles. Really glad I didn't include my name. God's about to bring the whole house down, ladies and gentlemen. These bunch of sex trafficking mongrels are about to be exposed. These bunch of pedophiles in Hollywood are going to be exposed for who they are. I don't care what you think about fraudulent Sleepy Joe. He's a sex trafficking, demon-possessed mongrel. He's of the left. He ain't no better than the Pope and Oprah Winfrey and Tom Hanks and the rest of that wicked crowd. God is going to bring the whole house down. I said he's going to bring the whole house down. He's going to burn the whole thing to the ground. He's going to expose all these bunch of pedophiles. I'm telling you, he's going to expose Kamala Harris for the Jezebel demon that she is. Whoa, hey, take it easy there. This guy is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs right here. He's got like 100,000 followers on Twitter. I don't know how many people go to his crazy church. But I just want to give you a little sampling of the nuts that we've got in this country. They're very influential and apparently think if you're a liberal Democrat and you're in entertainment, you're also a pedophile. Huh. All right, well, I drove back for like three hours last night after dropping Ava off at camp. I listened to, uh, I think, all three of the major network Sunday shows, and I don't know why, but this was the most important moment or I thought the most convincing argument made on the Sunday shows 
This is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's on Meet the Press. And Chuck Todd does ask her a really good question to respond to Senator Kirsten Sinema's op-ed that got a lot of attention as to why we shouldn't get rid of the filibuster. And I thought AOC makes such a sound argument as usual in this clip and wanted to share it with you. It's almost uh, like two and a half minutes, but it's definitely worth it. Would it be good for our country if we did uh, did this? I know where you stand on the filibuster. So I'm curious what you thought of Senator Simina's uh, op-ed where she made this defense of keeping the filibuster. And she wrote, would it be good for our country if we did uh, did this, basically using the filib- uh, getting rid of the filibuster, only to see that legislation rescinded a few years from now and replaced by a nationwide voter ID law or restrictions on voting by mail in federal elections over the objections of the minority? I mean, look, the argument she's making is, Let's say you get rid of the filibuster, you get all of this progressive change that you would like to see, and then all of a sudden the roles are reversed and everything gets rolled back. Um, Is that a good enough defense to you for the filibuster? No. I mean, it is... uh... It's essentially an argument of saying, well, why do anything at all in case something in the future may change it? Uh, Political systems all across the country, I mean, all across the world, uh, pass legislation with majorities, and they're fine. And frankly, here's the thing, is that Democratic legislation, once enacted, is popular. Republicans have tried to gut Social Security. They've tried to reverse the ACA. They've tried to claw back on legislation that has passed by simple majorities in the Senate. And they haven't been able to because Democratic policies are popular. And once they are enacted, they are very politically difficult to undo. And so, you know, I do not believe in the defeatism of saying we will lose in the future and uh, that and this will automatically uh, mean that anything we do now is going to be reversed. So we might as well not do anything now. Our job is to legislate. Our job is to help people. Our job is to do as much as we can. And even if that's the case, even if that is the case, wouldn't it be better to get people health care and voting rights for three years instead of zero years, even if even if you concede the point that I don't even think is true in the first place. And so beyond that, then the argument is, OK, why 60 votes? Right. Why not stop at 70 votes? Why not need 80 votes to pass any legislation? Why defend a 60 vote filibuster when the Senate already amplifies a minority power so that the 50 Democratic senators already represent millions and millions and millions more Americans than 50 Republican senators? And so I would argue that 50 Republican senators is already a built in kind of filibuster esque firewall. All right. All right. Thank you, Chuck Todd. Great answer from AOC. What do you think? All right. Well, I'd love to hear from you on any news clips, any ideas, anything you want to send to me, stand up with Pete at gmail.com. But now it's time for everything else. All of the rest of the headlines, rapid fire style that I can fit in in a few minutes here. It's time for the news dump. <laughs> Farmer's cow giving birth a baby calf is stuck. Time for vaginal spelunking on today's news dump. Oh my God, that poor cow is going to have its vagina spelunked. Is those are those the two words I just never thought I would hear back to back? Thank you, Pete Co, for another ever pleasant news dump jingle. Let's start in France, where an important election took place, setting hopefully a prediction precedent for the national elections later this year. But mainstream candidates delivered a stinging setback to France's far right in regional elections on Sunday, according to ABC News. This thwarts the hopes of the far right winning control of the region for the first time and slows the momentum ahead of the presidential contest uh, contest next year. Yeah. That's a good news story, and I'm happy to hear it. Good when the Nazis in France lose. And while we're in France, let's just talk about the Tour de France, which has kicked off, and a fan reached into the roadway to try to get a sign picked up by TV cameras and caused a major pileup. You probably heard about this, but the Tour de France uh, left a tangle of bikes and riders. And according to uh, CNN, officials in France have opened up an investigation. The race resumes Saturday, continued into Sunday. The tour is on. 
and the idiots have shown up. They have them in France, too. Here's a round of rapid-fire foreign stories. Two Saudi women's activ rights activists are out of prison. In Spain, Catalans cheer the Spanish kingdom in efforts to ease tensions. Fires set at least 16 boats ablaze in Hong Kong. Pakistan says it's going to shut the Afghan border if the Taliban takes over. Riots in Lebanon over the economy leave 10 injured. In Hong Kong, pro-democracy newspaper writer was arrested, and 178 migrants were rescued by the Tunisian Navy. And back here in California, a man jumped from a moving plane at the Los Angeles airport. And a tragic story from New Mexico where five people died in a hot air balloon crash. And just absolutely horrific story. I was talking with my daughter about that yesterday. I was like, I never want to go up in a hot air balloon. Have you gone up in a hot air balloon, folks? I'd way rather jump out of an airplane or even off a bungee cord than uh, go up in a hot air balloon. But that's a terrible story. And I've never, never understood the uh, appeal of hot air balloons. Which does remind me, I do have to do a live read for Mike's Hot Air Balloon Extravaganza, which take place this weekend in Kansas City. If you love hot air... No, this is terrible. I can't make jokes. Just an awful story. Really, seriously. Gross. Terrible. Sad. Well, let's move on to something much better then. Sesame Street introduced gay dads and their daughter. That's right, there's a new family on Sesame Street. Nina, a regular character, introduced her brother Dave on family day. Dave, his husband Frank, and their daughter Mia all come to a party, and it's fantastic. So I feel like that's a good news story to end here on Gay Pride Month. Lots of terrible stories always happening. Always want to mention those are the aberrations. The good and the love is what's happening most of the time. That's why we don't report it. Okay, I want to get to my first and only guest on today's program. She is an author and a journalist. Her best-selling books, Hiding in Plain Sight, The View from Flyover Country. She's the co-host with Andrea Chalupa of the awesome podcast, Gaslit Nation. I always love talking to Sarah Kenzior. SarahKenzior.com, at Sarah Kenzior. Let her know you heard her here. We cover a lot of ground, uh, and this conversation took place before the Bill Barr article that I've talked about extensively, but I will be talking with Ellie Honig about that tomorrow, CNN uh, analyst and author himself about a book about Bill Barr. But right now, it's time to talk to the always awesome Sarah Kenzior. So here she is now. I've just told you all about her, the great and brilliant and fearless Sarah Kenzior, who just told me. Can I tell everybody? Yeah, go ahead. You use... A Walkman with cassettes. And there is, as we know, you, you make profoundly intelligent arguments for really difficult issues, moral issues, legal issues, political issues. There is no argument to use, uh, uh, to, to, to listen to a cassette. And I don't know much about music, but I'm pretty sure there isn't. So good luck. I have a great argument, which is I have all the mixes that people made me in middle school and high school, and I want to listen to them again. And when I have a Walkman and I bring it to the pool, I can just like sit there and pretend it's 1992 and there's no phone and there's no one bugging me and there's no Twitter. And it's great. So I'm pro my Walkman. You should be jealous of my Walkman. Well, listen, I'm I, I... I'm so conflicted <laughs> right now. I guess I'll just put up. You made a good point. It really like shook me. <laughs> I was not ready. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it's not a phone is a really you can you want to listen to music, but you don't want to have a phone. I mean, one could argue you could put it on airplane, but that's not really realistic or something. But you could also have a CD player. The sound of of a cassette is not as good as the sound of almost. I'm gonna a bring a CD player to the pool. No, but I want my mixtapes. My mixtapes are mostly not on CDs. Are your mixtapes like? Could you not remake them as just regular digital mixes, or are you attached to the nostalgia of who made them and when they were made and just the actual thing? I mostly just found them in my basement and wanted to see what was on them. <laughs> also, there's some stuff that just doesn't exist. There's just bootlegs and things that, you know, they're not there. They don't exist in the digital world. I'm the only person who has these um, these have copies. You, have you shared this with your podcast audience or your Twitter audience? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. I think on Twitter, I think one time on Twitter, I mentioned it, that I've been listening to music with a Walkman. Like, you know, okay, well, if I release <laughs> just this excerpt of audio to make it easy for you to share, I think you should have to share this to see the people who truly respect you 
and admire you. Will they push back on this? Will they question this choice? Final question on it. What do people say when they see this? Do it seem to it, having a Walkman in a public pool or in public <laughs> would, would attract as much attention to walking a ferret? Gen X, Gen X has my back. The teens really? are, are wondering what the hell, you know, they ask me, they're like, what's that thing you've got? Like, what's that thing they coming out of your around you at a distance and, and mutter? Yeah, they just like- shout at me. We're, you know, this is St. Louis. They just, they just kind of yell. And then I explained it, let them test it. And, you know, we're being very, like, <laughs> screw COVID provisions, whatever. Um, you know, they, they're G- Gen Z. Gen Z is cool. It's, it's the millennials that they, they look at me with judgment. The boomers, I think, don't know that people don't have Walkman. So, you know, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> boomers. <laughs> Still, well, it's all normal. Nothing's changed since 1990. It's all, it's well, all fine. Okay, I said final question, but what kind of headphones do you use with the? With, do you use the old uh, metal? Real shitty headphones, like you know, crappy headphones that you buy at Walgreens. I'm like going fully old school on this. I want the you know the 90s mixtape yeah, experience. I know, but you don't have the metal band over your head with the foam. Yeah, yeah, I totally do. <laughs> I do. I don't know if I. I I, because I bought it all as one thing. I bought it for thirty dollars and included the headphones. Buy it? Did you have Um, a time machine? No, they they have them. I got it somewhere online. (laughs) There, you know, I'm sure it's on. I don't want to recommend Amazon, but I'm sure it's on Amazon. I might have gotten it at Target, like something like that. It was really cheap, but I found this big box of cassettes in my basement, and a bunch of them were like mixtapes, and I wanted to know, oh, you know, what's on these? Can I still play these? Uh, You know, I was a little bored during COVID. (laughs) That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, we found a lot of things in our basements during COVID. So that came first. You found the tapes, then you got the Walkman, and then you went out. And then I was like, wow, I used to love like sitting outside when I was a teenager, you know, with my Walkman, getting a tan. I was like, I can still do that. So, and I want to have my phone and no one will bug me. So that's, you know, it's very relaxing. I feel like with your career and your line of work, like you can't care that much about what people think about you. You, you, Oh God, no, I don't care at all. Obviously I wouldn't be telling you this. (laughs) Well, I know, but (laughs) do you ever, does anybody ever, uh, um, get your goat at all like uh, somewhere like i can't believe like i don't know like if you were wearing something and someone made fun of it or do you care at all when anybody thinks about your i don't know the way you look or much i mean i care when they threaten to kill me or threaten threaten to kill my family members or create some sort of libelous narrative that prompts people to to threaten to kill me based on things that i've never said or done that has been a problem but that's just like the murder factor you know the whole oh she's not cool you know or i don't like i mean i've never been like this even when i was younger like if I liked something that other people didn't like, I didn't care because it's like, what, what does it matter? It doesn't matter to me. It shouldn't matter to you. I'm doing what I want. It's not hurting anybody. Like who cares? You know, uh, you simplify, uh, uh, our, our entire insecurities. And I, I, <laughs> you're one of those people. I, I love that. I, I admire that. I wish I had more of that. I have a little bit of it, but do you remember another thing that like you, is there anything else that you give me an example of from your adolescence or any time in your life where you're like, fuck the world. This is who I am. I wear this hat or I don't know. Is there other things that you just kind of like were, uh, no, I mean more just, you know, I I think tattoos. No, I mean, but I don't, I don't want tattoos. I like flinched when I got contact lenses. I'm not getting a, freaking tattoo yeah. i don't like permanence all yeah. that much yeah. anyway yeah. and also you know i used my husband has tattoos and i used him as an example for the kids when they were little and they'd color on themselves i was like you can't color on yourselves like look at daddy you know because he has like a black flag tattoo i'm like look at him he drew little boxes all over himself when he was your age and now he's had it his whole life oh, and that yes. kept them away from the markers <laughs> you are everything that you criticize it's you just are a parent not- you're- 100%. I was an autocrat. I ruled by fear and favor, <laughs> blackmail and bribes, you know, it, it, forget it. Oh, uh, that backfired. <laughs> that, same, that same thing has backfired for me so far. Grand, my, my daughters are now 13 and 16, but my wife has a few tattoos and I don't want, I don't like tattoos for the same reason, like permanence. And, yeah. And I tell them don't get tattoos kind of for that reason. And it's completely backfiring because my, oh, no. my, my, my wife uh, is a supporter. And so, yeah, my 13 year old just got a teardrop on her. Oh, face. gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I would definitely not let my, my you own 13 year old get a, Where get are a you tattoo. On face tattoos for your teen. Yeah, folks. yeah. That's a no for me. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. So first funish question. You are now Sarah Kens, you're the autocratic, uh, I don't know, leader of America. And you can force one of these three people to resign. Who is it? Get ready. They are Stephen Breyer, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein, or the uh, post office guy, Louis DeJoy. Who do you force to resign? Oh, gosh. Is well, that that's, that's, it, it is hard. I mean, honestly, because I picked Merrick Garland and he wasn't one of the oh. nominees. Um, <laughs> right. I was okay. like, oh, I already know the answer to this, but I don't. I mean, of those three, oh, gosh. Well, it's like DeJoy, they could get rid of him right now if they if they wanted to biden could get rid of ron bloom and then put someone in and they could fire <laughs> DeJoy. um i think i guess i would get rid of briar but i again because i see the weakness of biden refusing to get rid of DeJoy when that's something he actually has control over i think if he got rid of briar i'm not sure that he would be able to complete the appointment process or appoint somebody good, appoint somebody who's willing to work for America. I, I just don't, I don't have faith in the appointer for all of these and Feinstein. I mean, I, I'm just going to be, I'll, I'll be um, nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of things that I'm not going to say. I'll just say if Jello Biafra had beaten Feinstein, I'm thinking of this because that's one of my cassettes uh, instead dead Kennedy's. We yeah. would not be in this situation. They, they all need to go. Um, but the DeJoy situation right now is the most perplexing to me because it's causing things like people unable to get their medication through the mail, uh, people una unable to get mail in general. It's a serious national crisis. There's absolutely no benefit to it. DeJoy committed fraud, perjury, election tampering, all of these crimes. He, they could get rid of him right now and they won't. And I think there needs to be more of a serious investigation as to why an investigation into Ron Bloom, who's one of the people of the board on the uh, board of governors, um, you know, that remains there that Biden could fire and won't. Uh, Bloom worked for the same uh, company, Brookfield, that uh, Kushner was involved in when he made his dirty deal with Gutter. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, dirty financial uh, dealings here, corruption. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have no faith in any of these people. Well, I should have allowed in my uh, in that uh, question you to pick somebody because you would have picked Marla, Merrick Garland and, and you have uh, maybe it's three episodes ago of Gaslit Nation. You guys, you and Andrea, uh, Andrea, um, like spent a lot of time on Merrick Garland and you always talk about Merrick Garland. So so uh, let me hear what your uh, concerns are, questions, frustrations or uh, less subtle adjectives about him are. I mean, it's some of it is a frustration with Merrick Garland, the individual. A lot of it is frustration with a deeply corrupt, rotted to the core DOJ that Merrick Garland refuses to fix. But, you know, Garland is acting as Trump's personal lawyer. That's what Bill Barr did. And everyone expected Barr to do that because he's corrupt, because Trump appointed him, because that's what Trump envisioned the attorney general position as being. And he only put people in there that would fulfill that role. I think people expected, um, you know, that when the Trump administration was gone and there was a Biden appointed AG that that person would, you know, first of all, prosecute members of the Trump administration who had committed crimes. Um, you know, I think that was the best case scenario. The middling scenario is that they would just look the other way. But what we've gotten is even worse. We have the DOJ acting as Trump's personal attorney, like in the E. Jean Carroll case, where, you know, she is uh, suing Trump, uh, saying that Trump has raped her. The American taxpayers are now paying to defend Donald Trump, the rapist, from this lawsuit because Merrick Garland has decided that, you know, because he was the president, they can uh, basically take on that case. And he's also decided that because Trump was the president, he's immune to prosecution, investigation, etc. And this apparently, uh, you know, rolls over into other members of the administration who need to be you know, investigated. And, you know, when I say investigated, it's like we saw the crimes committed. Yeah. They often confessed to the crimes. They aired the crimes on TV. They tweeted out the crimes and the confessions on social media. These aren't hard crimes to solve. They never were. Like Mueller did not have some mammoth task. What happened here is that we have mafia organized crime infiltration of our government, of the DOJ. It preceded Trump. That's how Trump got in, in part. And it needs to be gutted out. And Merrick Garland and not only refuses to gut it out, but is actively participating in it, and he needs to go. When you say Merrick Garland is is re basically representing the president, and, and you mentioned the case, talking about E. Jean Carroll, the defamation 
uh, case against Donald Trump. And so Bill Barr took that on and it was and everybody went crazy. Like, what are you doing? This is not the government's job because uh, of the president saying that he didn't even meet this woman, which, of course, he did meet and so on. But they took it on first and everybody went crazy because the government should not have represented him. Like, I'm not explaining this well. You've explained it uh, on, on Gaslit Nation a lot. But now Merrick Garland has just taken over what Bill Barr started on that case in terms of defending him and and everybody's gone absolutely righteously nuts about that like mainstream moderate legal analysts losing their mind about this uh i I don't see any many people siding with him at all it's pretty surprising yeah it's unprecedented and you're absolutely right that people who initially thought merrick garland was a good choice these sort of you know centrist legal analysts these kind of institutionalists uh they they're they were blindsided by this, um, you know, and in, at first they tried to justify Merrick Garland's actions, um, you know, his defense, for example, of Barr and Trump, uh, you know, using executive power to attack protesters in Lafayette Square. You know, we've now found out even more information about that that makes uh, Garland's defense of Trump and Barr there look even worse. But uh, the E. Jean Carroll thing, I think, is what put people over the edge because there is um, no precedent to it. It's not just uh, Garland being timid and wanting to stay out of the Things. It's him aggressively acting as Trump's personal attorney. And you can say, OK, you know, Garland is an institutionalist. You know, he is representing a corrupt and broken institution and he is a corrupt individual. So he is protecting Barr. You know, Barr is protecting his predecessors. We need to remember that Bill Barr was AG twice. He was also AG during George H.W. Bush's administration, where he did things like let the Iran-Contra guys off the hook. So basically, if you start an internal investigation of the DOJ, you know, rooting out all of this corruption, this is badly needed, you end up uh, implicating a lot of very powerful individuals who have had their reputations laundered by the media and by other powerful officials. This is why you had all these idiots saying, oh, Bill Barr, he's so great, so respectable, he'll be a wonderful AG and he'll reign in Trump. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, you know, look up this guy. He's literally known as like the GOP cleanup guy. He's there to do dirty deeds and to do the cover up. And that's exactly what he did. They do not want that level of consistent corruption that happened over decades on end to be exposed to the American public and for people to have to face actual accountability. They want to live above the law. Merrick Garland wants to protect his powerful friends who all, who want to live above the law as well. And it's going to sink this whole country. OK, so let me go take a couple steps back and and going back to my question at the beginning of uh, not why you don't have a CD player, uh, or <laughs> CD player but, but of if you could, you know, force into retirement. It, it brings up another thing that you've been writing and talking and tweeting about, which is kind of you guys sometimes say, you know, what would Trump or Mitch McConnell do? And you're not it's not like we're saying that that Democrats should be the equivalent or should uh, we don't want to be like the people that that have are destroying our world. But at the same time, you know, you talk about the people that they pushed out of government, uh, out of the FBI. They they fired and hired whoever they wanted. It was it was just so I don't know the word brazen who they in the way that they fired. They broke all these norms. But in a way, it seems like what you're saying. And I, I think I agree with you got to get rid of these people. Mitch McConnell and Din- Donald Trump didn't waste any time. Mitch McConnell kept the Senate in session in August. Democrats are taken off like there are some things that Republicans and Trump and McConnell and others did or do that Democrats need to do as well is the point I'm making. Am I right about that? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you don't want to be like Trump and McConnell and commit crimes. You don't want to do things that are cruel and go against the interests of the American public. But you need to act with the speed. You need, you need to disregard norms and protocol that if they are not working, you know, if they're not you know, working as to their intended purpose, which is to uphold the rule of law, to benefit the American public and so forth, then disregard them. Do what needs to be done. You know, don't be timid about these things. Like the Lewis DeJoy situation is a case in point. Like Biden 
could have very quickly remedied that just in the way that Trump quickly, you know, fired the board, packed it with his lackeys and appointed Joy to begin with. They need to reverse it and they need to do it tactically at times in the same way that McConnell and Trump and Barr and others did. Because say, you know, what you want about them and there's plenty to say. They know how to get things done. And I don't understand this uh, allegiance to, you know, norms and protocol. It's different than an allegiance to law, which you actually have to follow. Uh, I don't understand the, the point of it. And I don't believe their naivete. Like, I think that's just a, an excuse for inaction and inertia um, because they don't want to act. They don't want to fight these battles. And I think in some sense, in some cases, they're happy with this level of corruption because it makes their backers more money. Like that is a if you want to get bipartisan, because we know how much they value that, uh, that is a bipartisan problem. That is a bipartisan trait is greed. Uh, and I think they're they're content to be greed, um, to be greedy. And they just know how to you know market that differently to a, a Democratic uh, voter body. OK, so let's now talk about you think you guys did a whole episode on the boot uh, Biden, Biden, Putin, <laughs> combine them like Jay <laughs> Wow. Uh, Biden Putin summit. And I think maybe we can start with a, a criticism. I forget what you guys said, but I think at least you or Andrea said this on your podcast. I can't remember what you thought, but I don't know why I'm talking. The point being the starting with that, it shouldn't have happened. I think that's the opinion of a lot of people that they shouldn't, that Biden shouldn't have met with him in the first place. Let's so starting there, should the summit have happened? No, it, it should not have happened. And that's, you know, my central critique of it. Like, given that it happened, it could have gone worse. You know, I mean, obviously, it's going to go better than a Trump Putin summit where, you know, Trump prostrates himself in front of the entire world to a foreign country. But, like, um, you know, it, it's good that they did separate press conferences, but, like, there is no purpose for it. All it did was give Putin a stage to spread his propaganda, to spread lies, um, you know, to to attack people. It legitimized, uh, you know, his mafia state regime. Uh, Biden did not make uh, demands of him, at least not in that setting. And the thing is, is like a setting like that, a public summit, you can't get aggressive about things that would be, uh, you know, good for Biden to be aggressive on, like sanctioning oligarchs, you know, and then later on, they went to issue a statement saying they were intending to do that. We'll see if it actually plays out in reality. You know, that's a setting where you're supposed to smile, be diplomatic, like this is not a ruler who we can be diplomatic with. Like this is a, you know, autocratic, brutal mafia state actor who's only gotten more aggressive as Western nations have coddled him and coddled his uh, oligarchs and his mafiosos and the powerful actors that surround him. That clearly does not work. So what this showed is that, you know, Biden has not learned any lessons from his time in the Obama administration. And that's actually a point that extends to many things. The coddling of Wall Street, the refusal to stand up to the Republicans, uh, the refusal to act quickly on matters of urgency, like our loss of voting rights, um, you know, the elimination of the filibuster, et cetera. They he is acting as if he, you know, doesn't remember the failures of that administration or, you know, the near loss of our country, our, our you know, uh, of like the capital of really like kind of basic elements of America to Donald Trump um, in his transnational crime syndicate and his seditious GOP backers. Like he's acting as if none of this happens. He's saying America is back, uh, trying to assure foreign allies of that. I mean, if I were a foreign ally, I would not be reassured at all because I'd look at a country that had its capital attacked in January. And they would see that none of the organizers or power, powerful individuals associated Associated with that attack have been, uh, you know, even investigated, much less prosecuted. They're out there calling for more coups. Uh, people like Michael Flynn, Ali Alexander, Roger Stone, uh, they would see a lawless country. They would see a fledgling mafia state uh, that is basically having a cold civil war um, and that, you know, yes, has managed to uh, handle the pandemic better than other countries, but that that's kind of it. Like, we're falling apart at the seams and our leadership is either 
in denial or actively abetting it. Uh, if I were a foreign country, I, I would be wary of us right now. I, I wouldn't trust us because I don't think we deserve it. It's interesting that you say that it's a cold civil war. I haven't really heard that. It's an interesting way of put thing, putting things, what's happening in America right now. And then you say, uh, you know, we've handled the pandemic better than most countries. And of course, you mean the second half or the Biden administration. Yes, of yes, the, the Biden. Oh, yeah. Let me be clear. The Biden yet, administration has handled the pandemic most better than most countries. Trump yet, did it worse. But yet you can combine both points by saying the 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 cold civil in the cold civil war, the blue states have handled vaccinating. The, 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 the pandemic continues to rage in places where people aren't getting vaccinated. It's like the cold civil war is affecting the vaccination rates and overwhelmingly blue states have have met the goals set by the Biden administration. But it's the red states in the cold civil war that that haven't. And I think that that's just uh, I just want to note that to combine both your points. It's a little simplistic, though. I mean, and I say this living in Missouri, which is the epicenter of the Delta, you know, strain. We're the state that has it. The blue, I don't even want to say the blue, the urban areas of St. Louis, of Missouri, like St. Louis and Kansas City and even Springfield, you know, which is in the in the Ozarks in a more conservative region. Urban areas got vaccinated largely. Rural areas where you're less likely to see people, you're, you know, maybe would have been less likely to catch COVID before Delta came along are slow to get vaccinated. They're also, yes, more likely to vote for Trump, more likely to watch Fox News and get disinformation, uh, you know, and so on. Generally speaking, the older uh, population of America in general got vaccinated, even if they voted for Trump, like the over 65s got vaccinated. It's younger people who didn't. So I'm not sure that like the red blue state thing is quite right. I definitely think there's an urban rural divide, but I think some of that may be just sort of like, ah, I'm not going to get it anyway. Like how many people do I really see every day? Like there's all sorts (laughs) of, uh, you know, reasons for it. I mean, I think now with this Delta strain, which is spreads much quicker, folks should get vaccinated. Um, You know, I I think with Trump, if he had remained in office, we wouldn't even have the opportunity to get vaccinated. They'd be selling those vaccines all over the place. They'd be hoarding them. They'd be trading them for all sorts of things. It would be an absolute nightmare. And so Biden at least, you know, carried out an equitable and quick uh, vaccine distribution and made it free. And those are all the things he should have done. And then dealing with the crisis, of people simply refusing to get it, that's that is more complicated. And that is, um, in part, I think, an outbreak of this cold civil war. Yeah, I like your your pushback and reframing it from red, blue to more urban rule, because I think that's uh, that's certainly more accurate. Fair to say Um, your thoughts, your thoughts, Sarah, on Rudy Giuliani being uh, disbarred and your thoughts on his son, Andrew Giuliani's video uh, in response to it. (laughs) Did you see that? (laughs) I, I saw a little bit. Every time I see Andrew Giuliani, I just see Chris Farley. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. Like from that SNL skit like 30 years ago. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, like, yeah, uh, uh, Matt Foley, <laughs> the motivational speaker. The one where Chris Farley was Andrew Giuliani. He played oh, him as a child. No, and he was like. He was dancing around whoever played Rudy Giuliani because that's what happened at Giuliani's inauguration. This is like in 93 yes, no, or something. I know, I know, I know. Yes. <laughs> it was really funny. And I was not like a big Saturday Night Live fan you know, because like, honestly, there's always just been like one good sketch per episode since I was a kid. But I, I do remember that because it was hilarious. And so every time I see him now, I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> I wish funny. Chris Farley was around. Anyway, that is not the, <clears throat> excuse me, that is not the point. Um, Giuliani should have been, you know, disbarred a long time ago. It's all also important to know that Giuliani is like the rest of Trump's lawyers and that they don't actually act as lawyers. Like the practice of law is not the reason they're there. They are fixers. They are people who threaten people. They are people who blackmail and bribe people. That's what Roy Cohn, Trump's original lawyer and his mentor did. That's what Michael Cohen did. Uh, Dershowitz falls into this category as well, although he is he is actually a lawyer who shows up to court. His impeachment lawyers, um, in particular David Schoen, he's a mafia lawyer. He proudly boasted that he is a lawyer for the Israeli and Russian mafia. So, of course, you know, Trump wanted him. Uh, He gave a, you know, notoriously bad uh, defense of Trump because it didn't matter. It's just the flaunting of criminality and the ability to abuse people and threaten them that matters for law. So when Rudy was out saying, I'm Trump's lawyer, I'm defending them, he wasn't even licensed to practice in D.C. Like, he was never really Trump's lawyer. But we have this system where cable news invites on 
and people like Giuliani or back, um, I guess, before he quote unquote flipped, although I still don't completely buy that, Michael Cohen, uh, they invite them on TV to pontificate and spread lies and spread propaganda. And it gives the country the impression of like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is really Trump's lawyer. Like, this is a guy we need to take seriously because he's like the lawyer of the president, even though he's obviously deranged. And, you know, that's that's what he was. I think he Giuliani's a long term criminal abetter of, you know, many uh, different uh, operations, you know, including those in Ukraine. But also he was one of the original abettors of Trump's crimes. Like there's old articles by Wayne Barrett from the 1980s about criminal schemes they pulled off together before Giuliani became the mayor of New York and certainly before his, you know, post 9-11 hagiography where he was America's mayor and so forth. Um, If it weren't for 9-11, you know, Giuliani would have been viewed as a scoundrel and a train wreck this entire last uh, two decades. That's how he was before it happened. I was working at the New York Daily News at the time and I had to prepare, um, you know, website packages about Rudy and Judy because he was best known at that point for cheating on his wife and then the towers came down and his career went up and that's yeah, my I was first a constituent. job, man. That's a shit first job, I gotta say, to have to write about Rudy Giuliani's oh, sex life all I summer. Know. Oh my god! You had to As pay. I'm 22, no. it was just cruel. No, you had to pay your dues. <laughs> and writing about Giuliani as a young reporter <laughs> working it in was New York City, awful, man. It was like so gross. And I'm just sitting there, like I gotta get out of this place. And then, yeah, well, of course, there's a terrorist attack, and I'm like, okay, I guess that that's worse. Anyway, but, um, okay, yeah. so that's yeah. You're so good at this. Like you're you're so good. I, you know, it's. It's one thing to, to listen to you guys talking about it on your podcast. I, I You know, people can have notes and stuff, but I always feel like you have just a file folder in your brain. I can say, Michael Flynn, go. So let me go with Michael Cohen and ask you this. This guy, Trump's former uh, confidant lawyer, um, consigliere, he – I don't know if you know this, and I'm asking if, if, if he's done this with you. He reaches out to all kinds of people and asks them – to come on his show. Yes, Has he, he, did, he did. His people did. I, I just ignored it. Why? Yeah, they, I want to hear you with about him. Why? Four or five wanna... times. Why won't you? Why won't you? Uh, because I don't trust him. And I think that one thing, you know, traditionally that Trump associates or just any kind of mafia associate has done is to try to rehabilitate their, themselves in the public light by associating themselves with former enemies, with people that would be presumed to have integrity because they criticize that person's actions. And I, of course, have criticized Michael Cohen many, many times. I wrote about him in my book. So if I'm suddenly deciding, no, he, he's OK now, a lot of people will take that very seriously. And Cohen is still, to my knowledge, trying to get out from house arrest. He wants his house arrest to end. And one defense that his lawyers could potentially use to end that house arrest is say, look, this is a guy who's been embraced by defenders of democracy, by, you know, scholars of authoritarianism, whatever. I just simply don't want to be part of that. And I'm sort of mixed on how I I feel about him. I do appreciate that he, he testified to Congress. He's the only one who did. And after that, all the testimony stopped. They came to a grinding halt. They they had a list. The House had a list of 81 people who they wanted to testify in front of them to investigate Trump criminality. And it was a really good list. It had like Kushner. It had Cambridge Analytica. It had all of these uh, various New York mafia figures on it. It would have been great if this had actually happened. Michael Cohen did it. It was pretty disastrous for Trump. It actually had an impact. And then after that, you know, Felix Sater was supposed to go next. He didn't show up. The whole thing falls apart. Michael Cohen is the only person person who goes to prison. Um, I don't feel bad that he went to prison because he spent his whole life being a criminal and, right. and getting away with it. So I'm sure. like, yeah, you deserve that. I do appreciate that he, uh, you know, stood up and testified. I think he thought he made a gamble and he thought, well, this is a good idea. This is a way that, um, you know, I could get in the good graces of people who maybe will cut me a deal. But of course, Trump's people are, aren't going to do that. And that's who's uh, in power there. And, you know, everyone else, I don't know. He's made a lot of money. I'll, I'll tell you that, you yeah. know, over the last few years, he's made a lot of money from committing committing crimes and then being like, oops, my bad. And I just look at this country and the people who are just struggling to survive at the most basic level. And I just think like, I can't, I can't get on board on, you know, helping this guy in any way, unless he is also helping others, which I don't really see him doing. And so it's a kind of a moral quandary there. That's a fair explanation. I really appreciate it. Um, You recently on a recent episode of Gaslit Nation uh, were critical of Nancy Pelosi. Well, you often are, but specifically about uh, that they hadn't 
uh, created a commission to look into January 6th. They now have um, <clears throat> and on the on the vote in the Senate about a um, independent com- commission and on the investigation in general, what should happen in terms of looking into investigating uh, one six in terms of the insurrection. You're seeing, um, you know, a lot of people be brought up on all kinds of charges. But as you guys, I think, often remark, these they're not going after uh, the people that matter. They're going after the, the the less important people, actors who are there. So let's the the question is about the insurrection, about January six, about what Congress has or has not done. Yeah, they need to go after the organizers. And the thing is, is the organizers, uh, their guilt is all in the public domain because they confessed it and they recruited people openly and they encouraged violent insurrection and they're still doing it. So it's not, again, particularly hard to figure this out. And I was you know, disappointed that none of these people were brought up at the impeachment hearing, the second impeachment hearing about the Capitol attack. People like Michael Flynn, Steve Bannon, you know, who was on record on January 5th saying, yes, you know, we're attacking Capitol tomorrow. Roger Stone. You're not allowed, uh, you to, say, know, you're not allowed to say Steve Bannon on this podcast. I'm so I thought you knew. <laughs> Why? What, what's the rule? Uh, I just uh, you know, I shared a studio with him, the one that you came to. In, in, oh, in and so sorry. When, when people mention his name. Uh, tr- it's triggering it's for like me. It's like PTSD. Yes. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, so, so yeah, that that guy, that gross, <laughs> you know, acid in the bathtub guy. Um, <laughs> Lynn Wood, Lynn Wood's Twitter, if they had allowed Lynn Wood's Twitter to be up, I often wonder this, you know, they banned all these Twitter accounts of the top insurrectionists who were actively recruiting people with conspiracy theories. Like, you could watch the whole process play out. Like, I, I remember watching this with Lynn Wood because he kept tweeting, yes, on January 6th, you know, we're going to storm the Capitol, we're going to attack it. And there were QAnon folks who were hesitant. They were like in his mentions being like, you know, do we really need to do this? This seems like a bit much, you know, even for me. And Lynn Wood was like, yes, I'm sorry to say it, but you absolutely have to do it. And they were like, "Okay." How many steps are there? I'm not in exactly the type of condition to storm anything. There were people saying that. They were like, I don't have health insurance. What if I get injured? You know, there were people like, I can't find a babysitter for my kids. I mean, it was insane. It was like the most normal kind of conversation, but it was all about storming the Capitol. And I'm like, if this were still up, if Twitter hadn't deleted it, and I know why Twitter deleted it. Like, I know their rationale, that they were spreading propaganda and the propaganda led to actual violence. So you need to take it down. I just wish, I mean, I hope that somewhere there's an archive of all of this because you could watch the whole process play out. But anyway, one thing to note is that the organizers of January 6th are the same organizers of a multitude of plots, one of which was election interference in 2016. Like these, all these people, they were pardoned by Trump because they had already been indicted. Like Roger Stone was indicted. Michael Flynn was indicted. Steve Bannon, I think, was pardoned. And then he couldn't be indicted. I can't even remember. I'm shaking Honestly, it's again. Like I'm having change. another seizure. Oh, you sorry, said I'm it sorry. Again. I said the, the S word. Um, you know, Ali Alexander is another one who is a major organizer of this yeah. and is just running around. He's on all these, you know, gab and right wing platforms saying, hey, let's do it again. That was fun. And they're doing yeah. nothing. And like, I am much more worried about somebody like Michael Flynn, who's general brother, you know, Charles Flynn is still in the military uh, and seems fine with the coup and who has tremendous wealth and power than I am about some rando who started researching like Pizzagate, went down some wormhole and like, you know, showed up drunk up at the Capitol on January 6th. Like I, those aren't the folks that I'm like, this is, you know, this is the big threat to our country. It's these very powerful operators who often have this veneer of, uh, you know, being official, like, you know, Michael Flynn, the general, like the former national security advisor, like they have all these titles and all these prestige. And again, this is very similar to the Merrick Garland situation. I think they don't want to investigate these individuals because it shows how deeply the corruption already exists within our government, within our institutions. These are not just outside randos and actors from, you know, around the United States who spontaneously showed up. This was a very well organized plot of insular political operatives who have served in official positions and possess high level intelligence. They don't want the American people or anybody to deal with the ramifications of that. And they don't want to deal with it themselves. And if they don't, I mean, we're just going to get go further and further. Like a failed coup is a dress rehearsal and they're going to do it again unless there are actual consequences. And the fact that we're nearly at the six month mark of that day 
And only now is Pelosi going to form a investigatory committee? I mean, it's deranged. Their whole rationale for stopping impeachment early and not having witnesses was that they were going to do an investigatory committee right away. And they did not. You know, Pelosi notably had to be dragged to impeaching Trump, um, you know, the second time. I think it's only through the efforts of Jamie Raskin that that even happened. Mm -hmm. She then blocked witnesses when the Democrats wanted to call witnesses. And Lindsey Graham was like, well, okay, sure. You know, let's call Nancy Pelosi. I I think she should have testified. Why not? Like, what do you have to hide? What's so scary? Um, You know, but she blocked that whole process. And as a result, folks are in the dark. And the GOP went on to completely rewrite this narrative, either saying they're tourists or they're Antifa or it didn't really happen. You know, they are, as we say on Gaslit Nation, gaslighting the country. And that is one of the reasons we needed an ongoing active investigation with constant updates. And just one last point is that the FBI has also utterly failed in this regard. Christopher Ray has utterly failed. He should be replaced. This is another person who Biden should replace. Why? Because he's not doing his job. I mean, the FBI is another organization that, you know, is rotten to the core. And we've had a succession of, uh, you know, very corrupt FBI heads. You know, I've mentioned um, on Gas the Nation in my book that, you know, two of the former heads of the FBI, Louis Free and William Sessions, went on to work for the Russian mafia. Robert Mueller is someone who has worked in a Bill Barr-like capacity as a protector of criminality. You know, he was blocking information from the 9-11 report. He was someone who did issue a warning about the Russian mafia, but then went on to not actually... um, you know, pursue it, even though he was saying this is going to destroy our country from within. This is going to destroy Western democracy. In fact, he said that in 2011. Jim Comey, of course, is a, is a disaster. He's someone who took the head of the, the Russian mafia off the, ten, the top 10 most wanted list once Trump became the nominee, which I'm like, dude, this is like a very clear pattern here. Um, and then Ray came along and then let Trump and others get, writ, get away with all sorts of crimes, works as their protectors, is, is also refusing to investigate people like Flynn, Roger Stone, um, the uh, person who we shall not name, et cetera. Like we need somebody who will actually do that. And, uh, you know, it is a national security issue. It's a public safety issue. I don't see it as a partisan issue because in the end, everybody gets hurt when you have elite criminal impunity. And there are also cases, you know, say the Sackler family uh, and their, you know, opium peddling and profiteering off of mass death, which they got away with. Yeah. The Epstein Maxwell case. There are a lot of high profile criminal cases that really bring together uh, the entire political spectrum. Like no one likes these people. Everyone sees what they did. Everyone is against it. Everyone wants them prosecuted, you know, wants the truth to be brought to light. And, and they still are hands off. They're considered untouchable. And that is a deep problem in our country. Like that's um, at the heart of a lot of things happening. And I, we need somebody bold to take that on. And Christopher Ray is not that person. Uh, so, when you look at uh, the current state of uh, our democracy and everybody is talking about – well, you, you just had Ari Berman on, which was an amazing episode of Gaslit Nation. I mean I, I, I pretty much listen to all of them, usually in the garden, Sarah, <laughs> and, uh, and that's probably not the best place because the garden is supposed to be a calming place for me. And I'm listening to you guys talk about uh, the end of democracy. But the Ari Berman episode so good. He's so great. And you talk about the stakes – What are the stakes right now with the midterm elections and all of these efforts to make it harder for likely Democrats to vote? I mean, the stakes are very high and I have great respect for Ari Berman, who's just been covering this so relentlessly. He was warning about this, you know, from the moment the partial VRA repeal happened, at least that's when I discovered his work. He warned about it in 2016 because it affected that election as well. And of course, it affected 2020. Um, And I I guess today, I think as we were talking, Merrick Garland announced that they are going to challenge uh, the voter suppression laws in Georgia. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that in time for the midterm election, but it's the first sign of life from the DOJ that they even care about this issue. And I think that that's because there's been a lot of pressure from the public and a lot of pressure from people like Warnock and Ossoff in Georgia saying, you know, hey, like we have we are losing our constitutional rights. We are losing our right to vote. Um, You know, this is serious. This is the end. And this is the thing that's been driving me crazy is like, uh, you know, we have a Democratic Senate, a Democratic House, a Democrat 
Democratic presidency, and they were full of promises about what they're going to achieve for the American public. And then they come up with new excuses, you know, the rotating villain, it's mansion, it's cinema, et cetera. And then they go to people and they say, well, here's how we fix it. We get a Democratic supermajority in 2022. So give us money. And, you know, if you don't have voting rights before 2022, if you don't have them before people go to the polls, if they're all going to be disenfranchised, the exact same voters that flipped Georgia into a blue state and so on, you're not going to get your Democratic supermajority, which is a bit of a pipe dream anyway, due to gerrymandering and all sorts of other factors. And so it's just incredibly manipulative. It is, you know, anti-constitutional. It's illegal. The stuff that Georgia and Florida and other states are doing. And the stakes are very, very high because if the Republicans come in, I mean, we're in like the eye of the hurricane. It is going to be much worse, I think, than when Trump was in power. Um, And I, you know, I'm I'm not sure that Biden is going to make it to like 2025. I've never been sure of that. I think it hinges somewhat on the midterms um, and, you know, methods that they may take to attempt to remove him. And I've had lots of people tell me this is impossible. I don't think that's the case. Like all the other things that folks have said is higher possible. Like Mitch McConnell can't block Merrick Garland from the Supreme Court. Trump can't win. You know, Trump can't do that. Like how many times did you hear that between 2016 and 2020? They do it if they want to because they don't care and they don't follow the law could, and they don't follow norms. And so, you know, it's it's a big threat. How could the, how could he be removed? Biden from office? You're saying by if, I think if Republicans the, take over the House, they take over the House, they're going to do an impeachment. Oh, of, it right. doesn't even matter what the crime is. Right, right, like, no, right, it's just yeah. a crime, any crime. They're going to do that. The challenge is the same that, you know, the Democrats faced when they were impeaching Trump for actual crimes, which is removal in the Senate. I look at what's going on with Manchin, Cinema, Dianne Feinstein, you know, these Democrats, you know, they cannot keep their caucus together in the Senate now. And many of them seem easily manipulated, easy to bribe, easy to control and are serving the interests of the Republican Party. And I'm like, how hard would it be to find, you know, I can't remember the threshold. It's like 60, 65, something like that, to find enough to just get rid of Joe Biden. Like, what if, as Very in hard. all these... I find that to be, like, impossible to imagine, no matter how many... They, I mean, even if they somehow were able to influence one or two. Uh, I so hope it's impossible. Yeah. I mean, I, I... But it's like, it's a thing that, you know, they will absolutely try to do. Like, all of this stuff where... Um, you know, people are like, oh, gosh, Trump's going to be bogged down in impeachment. And he wasn't. He just went on, you know, oh, yeah. like destroying our country well, uh, all the same. Biden actually would be drowned down in impeachment because he doesn't know how to, to act like that. He doesn't know how to just sort of take care of business and be like, what is this, you know, annoying fly, you know, buzzing around my head? Like, I, I'm i not like a Bill Clinton fan, but he at least knew kind of how to handle that situation. Um, you know, I don't agree with the things he did, but he was basically like, you know, fuck you can star and just like kind of kept chugging along. Biden's not like that. He wants to be friends with people who want to kill him, who want to destroy him, you know, who have targeted his family. He's like, oh yeah, you know, let's reach across the aisle to people who want to punch me in the face. Like, I don't understand it. Like, it's such a, it, it's strategically stupid, but it's also just like personally insulting. I'm like, why are you lowering yourself here? Why are you not being a strong leader? And so I think he'll fold. It'll be like, ooh, maybe it'll be bipartisan if I just kind of step down here you know um, like i don't even know i want to take a step back you, you know you talk about like they'll impeach biden for whatever and i i wanted to ask you this here at the end because you and and, and andrea on your podcast on in, in your work you have studied autocracy around the world and corruption and and um you know you learn from historians like tim snyder and so on so I wanted to just talk to you kind of about what's happening and strategy and, and how it's working. And I guess, you know, you can cite probably many more examples off the top of your head than I can in terms of when Republicans and in, 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 in Congress, I'm not talking about Tucker Carlson or anybody else um, in media. I'm talking about in Congress or in leadership in office. They say things that are patently false, like there's no way to even spin it. Uh, for example, two examples, I think. Uh, yesterday, I just saw this. Marjorie Taylor Greene said that the Plan B drug is a what? How does it pronounce? A, a, abortifacient? It's an it, it causes an abortion when in fact the Plan B drug uh, prevents con, uh, uh, conception. That's what mm-hmm. the drug is. it presents. It prevents 
fertilization. She says it kills fetuses. It, it, it doesn't. But she can say anything she wants, and we can talk about more things she said. They're also taking this critical race theory and, and saying that it is a thing that it is not, and it is being taught in schools where it is not. They can take anything and say it, and you are the expert on how this has uh, happened in other countries, in this country, in the past, and in the present. And I, I just don't know how to combat that very well. How do you? How do Democrats? How do progressives? How do anybody who's not doing this combat the fact? Because I realize you can't get into a back and forth. You can't get into a policy argument when they say the sun did not come up today. You can't say yes, it did. You have to take some strategy. What? What? what how should we handle their complete? lies that catch fire immediately. I mean, I think first you just you tell the truth. You tell it in a way that's simple, that doesn't have a lot of jargon. You repeat it over and over until people get it. I think one of the biggest things that I don't understand about the Democrats is that the Republicans are, you know, one, supporting incredibly unpopular policies and committing a multitude of crimes. And a lot of those crimes are particularly offensive, I think, to people who tend to vote GOP. Like right now, they're targeting the military. They're going after the military. They're saying it's our enemy. You would think the Democrats would run some sort of campaign, like GOP, anti-American, they hate the military, they want to get rid of it, whatever. You know, like they don't jump at these issues. Instead, they just go on about these bureaucratic procedural things or they emphasize the virtue of bipartisanship, which, you know, no one gives a shit about. Like people just care whether they get things done. It's like we elected you to serve us. Our taxpayer money is going, you know, to you. And like if they were just passing things that would give people what they needed, then their approval rises. And you know, like people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, some of these battles need to be fought. You know, I think when people are, for example, the laws in Florida that are dictating speech on college Crazy. campuses saying that, you know, college students need to declare their political uh, beliefs to the state of Florida. I mean, that is an autocratic law. That is serious because that is an actual legal issue. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be, uh, you know, they need to be sued and it needs to be condemned and discussed. Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, unless she's actually acting in a position of power to implement something, I think is often better off being ignored because you go down this wormhole where you're obsessing about this, you know, person who's good at, at peddling conspiracies and lies uh, and you're ignoring a lot of the bigger structural problems, like say the elimination of voting rights and so forth, that I think people's attention would be better there. Or, you know, if you're going to have a culture war, like fight it on a terrain that actually impacts people, you know, like what I mentioned with uh, what is and isn't allowed to be taught in schools, what beliefs are and aren't allowed to be said, freedom of speech issues and so forth. Like she thrives off of that kind of attention. So you sort of have to do it on like an individual case by case basis, I think. All right. I will let you go. I love talking to you. I love listening to Gaslit Nation. Follow Sarah on Twitter. Everything about Sarah. Get her book in the show notes. Um, don't hang up because I do have a guest suggestion that I want to talk to you about. real quick. Okay. But thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you. All right, there's good Sarah Kenzior. I actually uh, was suggesting that she have Rachel Beitkoffer on, so hopefully she does. On their hit podcast, Gaslit Nation, which you should listen to every week and get her books and tell her you heard her right here on Stand Up. Pop her a tweet right now. Go ahead. I'll wait. Also, support this podcast. It's a daily podcast. I give you the news and usually two guests Monday through Friday right here. And I'd always love to hear from you. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. But sign up for a paid subscription. Go to the paid subscription link in the show notes or just go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Also, this week, July 1st, Thursday, John Carroll will drop this song for you to download, to buy, and uh, I'll let you know where you can get that as well. But let's take it away right now with Stand Up, John Carroll. So excited about this. Stand up, you gotta stand up. You gotta stand up.
Listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand 